Okay, perfect. So uh, I will. And hand it over to Josh to give his uh, introduction and presentation. Okay. Hi, Dave. Uh, thank you very much for having me here uh, today. To talk about the uh, licensure requirements. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, turn off my video. Um, okay. I assume everybody can see that okay. Yep. All right, great. Well, I'll get started. So today's talk is um, essentially going over the requirements um, about the for the GIT, geologist and training, and uh, the license. EG license, CEG, and CHG specialties. So a little bit about my background. I graduated with a bachelor's in geology from Chico State uh, in 2001. Started off in private consulting, doing environmental and engineering geology. Ended up getting my PG in 2006. And I moved to the Division of Mine Reclamation uh, 2009. And I did a lot of slope stability evaluations and water quality at mine sites around California. Ended up getting my CEG in 2016. Moved to the California Geological Survey and was a senior engineering geologist there, overseeing aggregate mapping, naturally occurring asbestos, radon, and critical minerals mapping. Um, and did that until 2023 when I moved to this position at the board as the registrar for geology and geophysics. So my talk today, I'll give a little overview of what who the board is, how it became a board, purpose of being licensed, uh, some information about practicing geology, responsible charge, sign and stamping, and then I'll go over the qualifications for the licenses. So who is the board? Well, it started as the, the Board of Professional Engineers in 1929. And why 1929? Well, in, in 1928, there was a, a large dam that was being finished up. And uh, you can see that there was no records of geologic investigations at the dam site. So you know there's going to be some problems with that. And within a few minutes of the dam being completely filled, it failed um, catastrophically. And it emptied the reservoir in under an hour. And uh, loss, of, loss of lives, all kinds of things were, were problems. So the, the legislature determined it was necessary to start licensing these folks. So here's kind of a what it looked like at an hour after it was done. Uh, pretty amazing the power involved in that. And so that's how the board came. And I mentioned no geologic study. Well this is this is what is there. There's a kind of a superimposed dam. You can see uh, it's a conglomerate on the Cespi formation and uh, a schist that was a old landslide deposit with the thrust fall in the middle. So um, that wasn't that wasn't accounted for in the design of that. So it was important to start licensing engineers. Um, its main purpose is protection of the public. That's the board. It's made up of fifteen board members. Eight are public members. Seven are practitioners. One of which is a geologist. That is not me. I'm board staff. And uh, I help out our enforcement unit, as well as the exam and licensing units. Um, so how did the geologists get into this? Well, after a lot of landslides and slope failures in the Los Angeles area, after some rainstorms, they decided we need to license geologists. And so the Geologist Act was signed in 1968, came into uh, existence in 1970. Um, 
BPELS became B became BPELS G, BPELS silent G, maybe BPELS again, but we they added the geology in 2010 and in 2011 officially added geologists to the name. And like I said, the highest priority of the board is protection of the public. We license qualified individuals, enforce laws and regulations, and promote professional conduct and provide information to the public and licensees. So licensing geologists is important as we have seen uh, and it includes how geologic factors affect infrastructure, with a sustainable economy, with mineral resources and not having uh, problems with, with buildings occurring. Uh, environmental protection, obviously, standards for competency. So um, not all careers as a geologist actually require a license. Uh, if you work in a mining industry or oil industry and all your work stays in-house, it's all confidential data, there's no reason to sign and stamp it because we are here for protection of the public. So if the public is going to see these documents, then it needs to be signed and stamped. Um, so there is uh, increased opportunities if you're licensed. As many of you are here, are licensed, may know this. You have more credibility. There's obviously financial incentives at the state. You get you get into range D, but with that financial incentive, also becomes also comes in a, a professional responsibility. Uh, here's our laws and regulations that we are charged with here at the board and I'll be kind of keen in obviously on the geology and geophysicist act the business and professions code it's also um, referred to and also the California code regulations uh, section 3000 is where the geology begins so the practice of geology this is a, an important one for state agencies is is uh is when geology is done for others and the documents are made available to the public. And so, like I said before, if, you, if it's all solely within the organization, it's considered an in-house document and doesn't have to be signed and stamped. But any of the work that we do at the state as geologists, that is the practice of geology and um, responsibility has to be taken for those. So that's responsible charge. So basically you're accountable if you're performing the work or making technical decisions about someone else's work. Um, so it's essentially defined in 7805 as using independent direction or initiative and independent judgment of geology or ge geological work. Competence comes into play just because you're licensed doesn't mean you can do everything. If you say never done a slope stability evaluation, you probably don't want to take on the photo to the left here of a large, large mine slope, big high wall. You maybe don't want to be the one in charge of that if, you, if that's not something if all you've done is groundwater work. Similarly, uh, an engineering geologist may not want to take on an environmental project. Some of the common violations we see are when somebody is a geologist or especially certified engineering geologist uh, by practicing civil engineering. You can't design anything as, a, as an engineering geologist. Uh, I'll get into the definition of engineering geology in a, in a few. Uh, we also see geologists practicing geophysics and or unlicensed folks practicing geophysics. Uh, if the if the geophysical aspects of your project, if that's all you're doing, then you have to be a geophysicist. Geologists can practice geophysics if they if it's part of their larger geological investigation. So it's just kind of a an interesting uh, prohibition of offering on that. So signing and sealing documents. So any and all. Plans, specification reports, any kind of document that you're practicing geology, as I described before, shall be signed and stamped. 
to indicate who's responsible for those comments or for that work. And that's similar for, for this slide here. If you're reviewing as a state agency, you're reviewing someone else's work, you're not actually doing the work, but you're making technical judgments about it, saying, yes, this meets all the requirements or no, you need to, and uh, there's some data gaps, you need to fill these data gaps. That's practicing geology and that letter needs to be signed and stamped. Okay, so now on to the qualifications for licensure. We call it the three E's at the board, education, experience, and exams. So in California, I'm sure a lot of you know, we now since uh, 2018 and on forward, we've had very specific education requirements. The um, regs were added, they added the ABET accreditation. It's similar to what civil engineering programs have, uh, there, most of them are accredited under ABET. And so the board worked with ABET, they're an accreditation firm, and they have an applied and natural science degree. Well, there's only two, two or three programs in geology in the US that actually have this, but we're hoping more will get it because then you don't have to worry about the 30 semester units and, and meeting all those specifications because the ABED accreditation makes sure you have all those. So it's, it's, I've looked at the curriculum for the, say, um, Arkansas Little Rock University has this accreditation through ABET. It's essentially the same as our 30 semester units. So we'll get into those in a few, but we also need experience under a um, licensed professional to for that under their responsible charge for your to be um, qualified and then you have to pass the three exams the ASBOG exams the association of state boards of geology these are national exams and the fundamentals of geology practice of geology and then we have a california specific exam we're one of only a couple states that has a specific exam in addition to the ASBOGs so this chart kind of breaks all that down. Uh, for the GIT, you just have to finish your education and then you can take that exam. You don't need any experience. And then for the PG, you need the education and then you need five years of experience. But you also, you get two years of credit for an undergrad degree. So you really need three years of professional experience and then you pass the exams. Okay, so here's the education requirements. This box in green, the four required core classes, earth materials, which is essentially a mineralogy or petrology, you need four units of that, structural geology, stratigraphy, sedimentation, and then the upper division field. Uh, upper division field and structural geology are the two I see missing the most often. And then folks have to go back, find a, a course that they can take at a university that will allow them in. Uh, and there's there's different options for that. So you, if any of you need that, you can reach out to me. Um, and then you take two in this applied. You could take all of these and, and then qualify, but you need at least two. Um, the most, I, most often I see engineering geology, hydrogeology but any of these other ones will count as well. And then um, that gets you to where you only need another nine units. And then it's kind of up to your discretion on which courses you want to count. Usually it's one of these also. And then this is a little chart that I use when I'm reviewing someone's transcripts. I make sure they have the earth materials and structural strat. So it's just kind of like that chart I just showed you, but this is something that we use in-house. It's also available in our FAQ document, which I'll show you in a few minutes. So what does field geology mean? Essentially, it's most most programs have a field, a field, summer field, or a couple of different field classes. It doesn't have to be all one class. It can be five, one to one unit upper division field courses, if that's what your university does. 
know, Cal Poly Pomona does something like that. And same with uh, Sonoma State. Um, but it needs to be, it needs to have a field component to it. It can't just be all in-house and in indoor data evaluation. And there's other options. You can do an independent study. If you can get a professor to okay um, an independent study research project, say you went, you didn't get a field class in your undergrad work, but you went and got a master's, then that thesis, if it's a field, uh, field heavy, then that thesis could be used, and that's kind of up to up to me on if it if it meets the requirements or not. But it can't just be a seminar or a conference or something like that. It's got to be an actual something on a transcript from an accredited university. And then as a geology applicant, you go here, you, you hit the applicant tab at the top. It takes you to this page. You go into BPELS Connect, which is our online application system. And then at the bottom, you can see the frequently asked questions. You click that link and it's a 54 page document that has a lot of it and it's searchable. So you can kind of type in keywords and find what you need to find or also use the table of contents and that. This is where you get when you go to BPELS Connect. You, at the very bottom, click here to create an account. You go through all of that. But we do the username, password, and then you get this dashboard screen. Once you're on your dashboard, you can pick the license type you want, geologist in training, and then, uh, or PG or whatever you have. The CEG and CHG are not on Connect yet though. So uh, those are still paper applications and you download those off our website. But here's kind of an inside look of what Connect looks like. You run through the tabs on the left. Um, you do have to submit fingerprints through um, an agency that, that does these fingerprints for you. It's not no longer on fingerprint cards. And then you once you pay for the GIT, you're, you're ready to sit for the exam. And then you can schedule 48, 45 days ahead of time. So the FG exam, the ASBOG FG exam, it is not called the GIT exam. The GIT is the certificate. Um, it's 140 questions over four hours. And then uh, if you pass that you'll and you meet all the other requirements, fingerprints and all that, you can get a geologist and training certificate. It's not necessary to get this. You can just go straight to the PG and take all three exams at once. But this is a good way to kind of get started. And remember, it is not a license, but it is a protected title. So if you are not, if you have not gotten the certificate from the board, even if you have passed the FG, you're not a GIT until you get this certificate. And so when you're preparing for the exam, there's these um, on ASBOG website, it gives you exam blueprint and information on what the test is on. So those are very helpful. They also have a study guide on their website. And uh, you can see it's very wide ranging. So it's, it's almost impossible for everyone to know everything, but the FG is essentially testing your bachelor's knowledge. So you kind of learn all these things when you get your degree, here's their website. Um, and then this does recommend, it does have this exam prep that's now available and you can buy that through them. Um, I've not taken that course, but I, uh, there's other ones out there too, but since this is ASBOG, so I'll kind of show it to you all. Okay, so now the experience. So like I said, you get 24 months for the 30 units. You can get up to 12 months granted for a master's or a PhD or for teaching. And you can't count your professional experience while you're in school because you're getting credit for those for that time while you're in school already. So it doesn't double count. And then you need three references that are either a PG, we we'll also accept civil or petroleum engineers for a geology license. And then you can also use an unlicensed geologist that's legally authorized to practice. Like in those fields I mentioned, like 
oil industry in-house um, in-house work. Okay. And then this is what your references will get through Connect for the PG license. And you fill out your engagement date. So I worked for this person from this time to this time. This was their job title. Um, they have this, they have a license, it's this number. And then you send it to them and then they independently will review that and send us directly. So you'll never see what the what the reference writes about you. Um, it's almost always positive though. It's good to check with your references ahead of time. Make sure they'll give you a positive reference. Okay, once you your application is approved, then you get emails saying you can sit these exams. And so you'll schedule them through our Prometric vendor. And ASBOG has a similar but slightly different branch of Prometric. Um, and then you can see the exam, the FG exam, like I mentioned before, the practice of geology is 110. And then the California specific exam is you get three hours for 95 questions. And Prometric's all over the North America. So you can usually find something close to where you're at. You no longer have to travel either to Sacramento or Long Beach to take the exam, which is really nice for, for the applicants. We have seen improvement in scores after computer-based was, was a available. Okay, so the title authorities, certified engineering geologists, certified hydrogeologists. So these are just titles. A professional geologist can practice engineering geology and hydrogeology. The only caveat to that is if you're working on a school or hospital review that's uh, under DSA, Division of State Architect, you submit those uh, for review and those, those are required to be a CEG and a geotechnical engineer on the engineering side um, under the California Building Code. But as far as the certified hydrogeologist goes, um, there's no such requirement. So it is strictly a title authority. You cannot call yourself a certified hydrogeologist if you do have not taken and passed that exam. Same with CEG. And you can see here the definitions out of the code. You can see it does not say that you design things. You provide information to a civil engineer as to what kind of geologic factors might affect their project. Okay, moving on. So the requirements, so you need seven years of experience. You still get to count your two years for your bachelor. So it's five years after your bachelor's or four years after a master's degree. And you need uh, three references that are CEGs. And uh, go on to my next slide. It provides a little more uh, specialty specific information. So for the CHG, uh, you need seven years of experience. So two years of, of a bachelor, five years for experience or three years for a master's and four years of experience. And your references um, either have to be a CHG or it can be a licensed PG who's been practicing hydrogeology under their license for at least five years. And to document that, they'd have to provide a little resume CV that shows that they've been doing that kind of work for that amount of time. And similarly for the CEG, but we will also accept a civil engineer that's practicing under the limited exemption for engineers to practice geology. So some important things about licensure is that whenever uh, you practice, you need to be licensed, except for those few instances I mentioned, but by and large you need to be licensed. When you're applying, you're, you're not applying to sit for the exam. You're applying for the license. So you have to meet all the requirements of licensure, then you get to sit for the exam, but it's, it's a minor but important detail. 
And we do not license agencies. We don't license companies. We license individuals. So if an individual doesn't follow the business and professions code, there's nothing the agency can do to protect them from the business and profession codes enforcement. So that's why it's very important to know these as the individual. And the laws and regs do change throughout time. So while this is being recorded and this information will be out there, it could change. So always check if it's down the road and you're not sure about something. Give me a call. I'm happy to, to talk with you and work through any questions you might have. And the board exists solely to protect the public, not promote the profession. And here's uh, some information. Our website has a lot of information. It is very text heavy. So there's a lot of reading required, but it's important to, to be familiar with these. Um, under this red arrow, you can see this laws and regs tab. That is something you definitely want to go to, download those laws and regs and be familiar with those. And here's my contact information. That's my direct phone number. So you can reach out to me. If I don't, if I can't answer at the moment, just leave me a message, I'll get right back to you. And you can also email me. And let's see. Okay, so that's all I have. You can go ahead and stop my share. And... Excellent, thanks so much, Josh. Uh, we have plenty of time for questions right now, if anybody has any. Yeah. Um, I've got a quick question. Um, yeah. For reasonable accommodations for the test, does that go through um, details? Do we send uh, if we need additional time for whatever reason, or we have um, an issue that we we need um, help with on the exam? Do does that go to details as a request um, in the application? Yes, it would go. It would go through our exams unit, uh, or. Um, if it's an ASBOG exam, I'd have to go through ASBOG. I personally okay. don't. I don't um, handle that side of the things. It's more of our administrative side. But that's a good question. Yeah, I have I've heard of different accommodations out there. Um, and then second follow-up kind of related um, question is, do you make any exceptions for field coursework um, uh, if, if there's a, a, a physical disability, um, is that taken into consideration? Um, that would be up to your university because I have to go with what's on a transcript. So um, I, I'm sure that any university would, would be able to come up with some sort of coursework that they could do, but I don't, uh, that's not that's something that I would make the de determination on. Got it. Thanks. Yeah. Hey, I've got a question about the field coursework as well. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I'm in the boat where I, I need to get those credits and I'm wondering if on the website or maybe we can just talk separately if the, you or uh, the board has any recommendations for programs where you can like knock that all out in one go, you know, maybe like an intensive summer program mm -hmm. that typically meets those requirements. Yeah, there's, there's some different ones out there. I know that the South Dakota School of Mines offers a winter course um i think they actually do it in arizona but you can check oh, okay it. cool there's other schools like cal poly pomona offers modules that you can um, sign up for individually like if you just need two units you can take the i think most of the university i think there's like a open campus website and you can go there and find find different things i would reach out to whatever university is closest to you uh, 
and, and talk to them. You can also loop me in on an email to them. And I have good relationships with a lot of them because I've done presentations around the state for quite a few of the universities and happy to advocate to, to get you in on to whatever you need to do. But yeah, feel free to reach out to me, send me an email, we can talk more. Great. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks for being here. Uh, I saw Kevin and Brown had his hand up for a, for a second. Do you still have a question, Kevin? Hi, Josh. Um, no, I was uh, I was applauding you for your <laughs> presentation. Oh, okay. Those were but that was type. I was typing a question in to um chat while Demir was speaking. So maybe I'll just send that and then you can read it. How's that sound? Sure. This is a loaded question for you. Here you go. <laughs> are there are there examples of specific enforcement actions taken by BPELs against state regulators for failing to sign a stamp correspondent that was entered in the public domain? E.g. GeoTracker. I cannot talk about enforcement cases because they're related to individuals. Uh, but that's not outside the realm of possibility. The board can individually take interest in agencies and look at public documents and um, open enforcement cases against the individuals that are, for whatever, say, incompetence or not signing stamping, things like that can definitely um, warrant uh, the, the board to open on them. Yeah, I thought so. I just wanted people to hear. Yeah, no, it's- Maybe the people that really need to hear it aren't on this call, but um, that's definitely an issue, I think. Yeah, well, and it's, you know, I've, uh, it's not, you know, not something that's happening at the moment, but it could in the, near future where you know somebody sends something to the board as a you know you, you know there is a enforcement where you can file a complaint online through connect it's very easy you can do it um you can do it as who you are or you can you can be anonymous and you don't have to type in any of your contact info you won't hear what happens with that case you won't get any updates or ask for further information from it. But, you know, if you, if somebody was to send in, uh, hey, this agency is doing this and here's a, here's a documentation of it, then the board's enforcement group could look at that and, and follow up on it. Yeah, so we first back in twenty back in twenty seventeen, Lori Rocca, your predecessor, right, did a presentation for a GSM, and I think the Geologists and Geophysicists Act had just been updated. I think the engineers have always had this in their act, but I think that there was an update that that was very specific about basically state regulators aren't exempt, right. And here we are, seven years later. Um, yeah, yeah, unfortunately, it'll probably take an enforcement action type of thing to get people to. It usually does. That that usually gets people's attention. But you said in one of your slides, is that I just wanted to, you said by putting your stamps on something, it means you're taking responsible charge. I've been putting my stamps on emails and stuff like that. It's just to protect my butt. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not necessarily because I think I'm acting in responsible charge. Is that. Um, uh, Am I okay doing, I mean, I assume I'm okay. I'm not going to get in trouble for stamping something just because right. I'm yeah. going to cover my, you know what, but yeah. Okay. No. Um, the main thing is, but I'm not sure I'm in responsible charge even that, I mean, that's the thing. I'm, hmm. Well, you're in yeah, responsible so. charge of your comments. So if you're like, okay, I've reviewed the documents and you need a weld in the down gradient direction mm -hmm. in this area. Right. Well, you're responsible for, you're taking responsibility for those comments, not for the work that the person did. Right. They're responsible for their work. Absolutely. You're, but you, when you're going to, you know, when you're going to think about it like this, if you're going to cost somebody's client thousands of dollars to go install a well or two, 
there should be a licensed professional that's requiring that work. Preaching to the choir. I agree with you. <laughs> Just wanted to get it in the recording. I wish I was, I'm not in charge. That's all I could say. You know? Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm, thanks, Kevin. I'm more concerned about the unlicensed. I mean, the licensed people. Yeah, it's a good idea. I don't know how heavy the board would be on somebody that failed to do it. You might slap them on the wrist a little bit and say, don't do this again. An unlicensed person, it's really going to be exposed, I think, if they're. You know, yeah, if you're unlicensed and you're signing it saying do this. Yes. Yeah, but, and then, yeah. you know, not following the business and profession code where it requires signing and stamping, that's, um, you know, you're not protecting the public by letting them know that those right. comments are done under the responsibility of someone that's licensed. So that's so pretty getting li Being licensed by, by the state is not just so you can get a nice paying job, right? So it is that is exactly right. It's not just so you can <laughs> jump, jump up to range D. It's, it's or become a, a, become a senior, right? Yeah. Take responsibility for yeah. your work. Yeah, I hear you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate, appreciate the question. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I got a question about the specialty certifications. Uh, I think you mentioned that you can self uh, reference for uh, the CHG and CEG. Yeah. Um, for the years that you self reference, is, does it need to be, you need to be licensed as a PG to self reference? So if you got your PG and you've had it for a few years, you can only self-reference for the years that you've had the right. PG. Right. Yeah. Okay. And then you'd need to submit uh, some examples of your work to back that up. Okay. And th that would be stuff like uh, that you produce yourself, not something that you've reviewed um, um, right. independently. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And if you can, and it can be under, you know, stuff you did under someone else's responsible charge and then, um, but you were heavily involved in and you can document that. So you, you're on the signing list, but weren't the one that stamped it. But for the most part, yeah, you need to be under your license for the part that's under your license, show that you were licensed and should send in the, an example of those, you know, a PDF of your report or something. And I'm not going to be checking it for, anything else but that it meets the definition of hydrogeology or engineering geology. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, morning, um, afternoon, Josh. Hey, Alan. Hey, I got a couple general questions. Um, the, uh, do you foresee any major changes in the future on, on any of these exams? I know the main changes have been like going to computer-based testing. But I noticed the other professions, they do what they call an occupational analysis, and then they, the outreach to the professionals and based on the responses, they kind of change the format and, you know, the priority of the different types of questions. You see anything down the road in the next two or three years of that happening for the tests? We just finished the occupation analysis for the California specific exam. And the board just approved the new, um, the new test plan, and that you can find that in the board's uh, material packet from the last meeting. So for the people, you know, getting ready to take the test, they're good to go for the next four or five years. It's not going to change, right? It'll be another five years before we do another analysis. Okay, so good. it didn't change too much from the previous test plan. Previous test plan, I believe, was a 2018 or 2019 document. And so we just got the, we did the survey in January, comp uh, compiled all the data from the survey. We had about, I think we had about 700 people respond, which is a pretty good response for, for an occupational analysis survey. Mm -hmm. And that's really important, right? To get that response. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is super important. Uh, so I guess this is just for the people that are in process. Once they get your license, if you get that survey request, it's really important to take. Yeah, 
10, 20 minutes to fill it out. Yeah, it can take up to a half hour depending on how how much you know detail you go into. But uh, yeah, it, it, it did just finish. So if you're, if you're looking for that, you can find it on our, the board's website. Okay, a second question um, regarding this field experience, academic field experience. I, I think it became a requirement to be able to sit for the exam, what, in 19, 2019? Yeah. So I was at the sunset hearing uh, a couple of weeks ago, and they said the, in the report said that uh, you were looking at um, different op options in the future for some of the people that might have, like uh, one of the, uh, Demir was saying that he was one of the few that didn't have that academic uh, requirement fulfilled. It said that the, your guys were going to first need to, the recommendation was to look at the magnitude of the problem. So are you guys planning doing any outreach and seeing how much this has affected people's ability to be able to apply for the exam? Yeah. Um, it, yeah. And it'll take a, it'll take a couple of years for this to, right. to happen and then to get through um, a rulemaking and things like that another year or two. Um, these things will, it will take a while. It'll take, I would say at least three years before this would, you know, be pushed through. Um, but we're looking at um, more experience related pathway, if not, you know, just for the, for the field, but maybe for other areas uh, of the education. But I mean, I agree that it would be probably be beneficial to allow somebody that has 10 years of field experience, you know, 10 years of practicing to, you know, substitute it. I don't know how many years it would take, you know, that would be something that would be kind of fleshed out in a workshop or two around the state, get input from stakeholders and licensees, applicants, kind of see where they're at. But also the magnitude of the problem might, you know, maybe six people a year reach out and say they don't have the field class. Mm -hmm. Most most programs have it and require it. Sometimes if you do an earth science degree uh, if, or a bachelor of arts, it won't have the field component. And those are the people that I see the most that have to go back. The nice thing about it is you can go back. You don't have to go back and get an entire degree from some other program. You can just piecemeal and take take the one or two classes you need. It is it is a hurdle, for sure. Yeah. So it sounds like this is going to take years. So the path of least resistance is to go back to academia and, and like you said, that South Dakota sound like a good fit for one person there. Yeah, that one can work. Um, I think Sac State would allow you to do it um but like i said i'll i'll help whoever it is I'll, i can hey i'd really like to get into to do this at san diego state i know those the, the folks at san diego state pretty well and they they allow people to take like structure i've seen a lot of people have a second um transcript from san diego state or uh, cal poly pomona uh, so yeah I think most of them. Oh, there's also a a groundwater hydrogeology program at um, Western Michigan that you would have to travel out to Michigan for, but it's a really good program that offers five units. So that one would be pretty good too. But should be a groundwater person. Yeah, as far as um, state agencies and PEG. Uh, we did put out a request to see if the, we can get a hold of the magnitude on it, but we haven't had very good response. So we're going to continue to try to do that. If we get any information, we'll forward it to you. Okay. Yeah. I would, I'd, I'd welcome that from you. Okay. And the last, yeah. last question is something I hear from the other professions is um, if you pass that um, you get your GIT, is that forever? I mean, even though things may change in 10, 15 years and you still haven't taken your professional exam, is it still good? You don't have to go back and redo it? Right. Yeah. There's no there's no renewal fee for a GIT certificate. Once you get it, it's good. 
And say so you apply to me and you've already taken the GIT. I don't even have to look at your uh, transcripts. So I, I've had people that applied recently, uh, say just last year, but they, they took their FG exam in 2016. So they're still good. They don't have to, I don't even have to look at their transcript and they may have gotten in. So they got in before the regs came in. They may have not even had the five units of field, but back then that wasn't the requirement. It was a geology degree, basically it was, or closely related subject. So um, I know that Lori did a lot of outreach ahead of time. Hey, the regs are coming in. If you've, you know, if you've thought about applying for the FG, do it now, do it now. And a lot of people did. So, I, cause I get a lot of applications that they took it back in 2017, 2018. And she was doing that outreach. So the only difference now, if you had it like 10 years ago, you didn't have connect systems. So now if you want to go forward, you got to go through connect. You got to make sure you get an account. That's the only way you can go forward to get the, uh, professional geologist yeah yeah you have to apply through connect now and you can submit say you took the fg in kentucky you just contact the kentucky board have them send verification that you passed the exam you can take both as bog exams yeah, yeah. yeah so those can be uploaded to us and cool thanks we'll accept that yeah so looks like kevin has his hand up Yep. Thanks. Um, I had a question about the stamp um, stamps. Um, I have both old stamps that say registered on them. And then I got new ones that say professional geologist because I had, I've sponsored several younger geologists for the exam. Um, if I get a technical report that has an old stamp registered, um, is that, re is it rejectable? Should I reject that report? Are the old stamps still apply that say registered i say no but i want to hear what you say uh, you know i say we should reject them because even if you looked at the act it has the stamps that you need it does it says professional geologist it does, it does say it. professional now that's something that some you could uh, maybe it's a technicality and i don't have to be that tough on it you know but well i mean what i'd probably recommend is you look them up on our website make sure that they're still you know in clear status and then, since you're writing a comment letter, write the little reminder. Hey, B Bells requires it. You know, uh, you know, I recommend you get an updated stamp or something okay. like that. Yep. No need to submit. Uh, you know, Another to report. reject it altogether. Right. I would just make sure. I would just do a, like a double check on them. And if they, you know, if they have questions about that or say then no, they don't have to. You can send them to me, and I, okay. I can point them to the. To three set section three thousand. I haven't rejected anything yet, formally, but <laughs> there's a couple. I mean, you could, you couple could old timers say, still that like myself that are. Yeah, you know, you have, could but, call them up and say, "Hey, go get a new stamp and resubmit this." I don't want to have this in my. I don't want to okay. accept a accept this in my in our right. public record. It's up to you on that. But. Okay. Yeah, it's a trivial kind of a trivial question. I yeah. I mean, the other thing was the other question I had was about reciprocity. Is there any reciprocity at all remaining no. count? No, I didn't think so, but I just wanna No, everybody has to meet the requirements. So if you're applying new today, you've been licensed in uh in a different state like Kentucky or Florida. You've got to demonstrate that you meet all the education requirements. You have to have three three references, and if you've already pat you've obviously passed the exams already, so you submit proof of passing the exams from those boards. And, but you'd have to submit transcripts, fingerprints, everything. Basically, have to apply just like anybody else. Yeah, years ago, I I got my an LG an LG and LEG in Washington State just by sending in an. Um, application and yeah. fees. And I had done a couple projects there, but to be yeah. fair, I wasn't, yeah. but it was pretty simple. <laughs> now I let that expire a long time ago. I haven't paid fees yeah. in years, but um, I just wondered. Um, yeah. Cause I know that used to be part of it in the past, a long time ago. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah. The old board may, may have allowed that, but okay. uh, everyone has to meet the same requirements. Good. Good. Yeah. 
Well, keep up the good work. Thank you. You too. Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting cranky. <laughs> I've always been cranky anyway. So. But the... All right. I try to up the profession, right? Try to always say, like, you know, the, let's yeah. let's get that bar off the ground and lift it up a little bit. Exactly. Let's make it it's professional. That's, right. That's what we're here for, you know, professional standards, protection of the public through yep. the through licensing. That's right. So. All right. Okay. Well, well if there's not anything else. I just wrap kind of up here. Thank yeah. You all. Yeah. Thank you, Josh. Thanks everyone for attending today. We're gonna get this uh, video recorded, posted up. Um, so we can uh, share it with anybody who wasn't able to be here. But uh, yeah, thanks again, everyone. David, um, there's something that just came in chat. This, you might want to just Oh, there's it. another. Um, OK, we see? got a question from Ron. Do you see that, Josh? OK, yeah, I see that. Um, we got a survey about the possibility of continuing education becoming a requirement. Do you have a sense of where that might go? So that is. That's going to be similar to uh, any new thing with the board is there'll be um, board members. There's a, a subcommittee, not necessarily a committee, but there's two board members that are actually um, looking into this and coming up with what other states are doing, uh, what it would take for our board to um, initiate this and oversee it and what would count, what wouldn't count. So there's there's quite a bit of time before that would become. There was a survey that just went out and we're looking at those survey results now. And so at a future board meeting, there'll probably be some discussion on that. So I would uh, encourage you to uh, look at the board's website, check the agendas, see if there's anything interesting on those agendas. And if you can attend in person, great. Um, Alan comes to all the board meetings, so um, he he kind of has his ear to the ground on on peg issues for geology and, and other professions. So uh, you can talk with him, or if it's available, you can log in through WebEx and listen to the meeting and, and do the public comment through that too. Hey, Joss, I just thought one last question as, you know, geologists working through state agencies is different than the private sector. Do you, and you did go over there some study guides one could, you know, you showed the website on ASBOG and others. Um, is there any other tips you might give to the group here on how to prepare for the exam? One of the things I remember is you don't want to wait to the week you're applying to reach out to your references, maybe you want to cultivate that a year or two in advance and be checking in with them. Uh, some any other tips like that uh, you might pass on the group that you think of. Sure, yeah, like I kind of mentioned, always always check with your reference, make sure there'd be a positive reference for you and someone you've been working closely with. So that's that's kind of a given. But and, uh, talk to them early and to let them know what, that they'll be getting an email from connect.noreply. And that's gonna be their reference form that they fill out, the part B of the reference form. Um, and as far as studying goes, there's, there's links on our website to uh, the test plan. That is a, a must. If you're taking a California specific exam, you gotta look at that CSE test plan. And it just came out. Um, it's not officially on our website yet, but it did it did get approved by the board. And so it's in those meeting materials from the previous board meeting. And you can find it in there in that PDF. Um, the land surveying one's also in there. They just finished their OA too. Um, so look at those. There's a partial reference list on the board's website as far as uh, documents that are that questions come from. It's not an exhaustive list because the bank is continuously being updated by subject matter experts in workshops where we do um, item writing. That's what we call questions. And um, so there's, it's not, and it says on there, it's not a complete list, but that's a good place to start. Um, all the laws and regs that might apply to the areas of practice on the test plan, those are in there. So 
So that's probably the best thing. Asbog has the study uh, modules that they sell and they have a, a test plan and a candidate handbook and things like that for the Asbogs. So check their website too. And then reach out to me and, and ask me if you have questions or trouble finding things. Yeah. Happy to help. Yeah, I found one of the most important things to do is just prepare a plan on how to pass, get your license. Yeah, yeah. Definitely takes a lot of a lot of hours of studying. Don't wait till the week before to start studying. <laughs> thanks, Josh. Yeah, thank you, Alan. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thanks, thanks everyone. I think we're going to wrap it up now. It's about one o'clock. All right, great. Thank you. All right. Take care, everyone. Take care, everybody. All right, bye. 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 -bye.